So now we get to Roman numeral 2. As leaders of big business and their allies in government aimed to create a unified, industrialized nation, they were challenged in different ways by demographic issues, by regional differences, and by labor movements. Number one, there was a huge expansion of the workforce. Uh, you have internal migration, people moving around the United States, farmers moving to cities in increased numbers to work in the factories. 1880 was the first year of the census where more people were working in manufacturing than in farming. 1920 was the first year where more people lived in the cities than on the farms or outside the cities. So sometime in between 1910 to 1920, that switch happened. Immigrants, the new immigrants from southern and eastern Europe and from Asia, uh, would settle in the cities for the most part. All right, the uh, Asian immigration would go out to the west coast, the Golden Gate out in the west coast, hence the bridge, and Ellis Island in the, over on the east coast. All right, now the effect of workforce expansion. You get a very diverse workforce, lower wages, uh, more child labor. The huge supply of workers led to lower wages. There were more workers than there were jobs available. And what does that do? It drives down wages and work conditions. So what do you wind up with? Battles over wages and working conditions. The union movement, a lot of strikes, a lot of unions begin to emerge. Local and national unions emerge to confront businesses. The Knights of Labor, for example, by Terence Powderly. The Knights of Labor was the first major national union to pop up. Skilled and unskilled workers. Women, African Americans. The downfall was, as you will see, the Haymarket Square riot, where there was a uh, there was some striking going on, and some anarchists threw a bomb at police and killed the police, and that kind of put a stain on unionization uh, in the late 19th century, early 20th century. But the real downfall of the Knights of Labor was, and I shouldn't call it a downfall, but again, when you have unskilled workers in your ranks, it lowers your bargaining position. All right, so what you wind up with is the American Federation of Labor takes their place. Sam Gompers, who you see pictured here on the right, uh, and they only accepted skilled workers, and, uh, which strengthened their bargaining position, and they were more concerned with what we will call bread and butter issues, issues of pay, concrete issues of pay and benefits. All right, also in this time frame, the South, uh, the New South, we become, we, you know, we start to call it, had some areas of industrialization. You know, leaders called for a new South. Henry Grady, who you see a picture there, editor of the Atlantic Constitution, called for increased industrialization in the South. You began to see more textile factories appearing in the South. And sharecropping and tenant farming, though, remained dominant. So it still remained agricultural, the South. And remember, in the sharecropping system, uh, the farmers, most notably, they were freed slaves, would kind of rent the farm and their rent was paid in the form of crops, and they were very often cheated out of any profit. So it was, it was, um, it was meant to approximate slavery. All right. Did I just skip someone there? Yes, I did. All right, so many African Americans were stuck as sharecroppers all, croppers, all throughout the 1800s and into the 1900s. All right, guys, we're almost done. Roman numeral three. Westward migration, new systems of farming and transportation, and economic instability led to political and popular conflicts. All right, so government agencies and conservationist organizations sought to extend public control over natural resources. For example, the U.S. Fish Commission, and this will be the only time we mention this. The U.S. Fish Commission was created in 1871 to promote and preserve fisheries in the United States. So it was the beginning of the national government uh, seeking to protect our natural resources, or some of them. And that's their, their flag, their logo. All right, we also have the Sierra Club. All right, founded by John Moore in 1892 uh, to advocate the protection of wild places on Earth, and it's still around. All right. Uh, once in a while, the AP test will love to ask about him, so keep him in mind. We also have farmer organizations that were resisting corporate control over agricultural markets. In other words, the railroads were kind of seen, hey, were they helping out the economy, or were they seen as the, you know, uh, this big behemoth taking over? Or taking over the land? So you begin to, to see granges, and there's actually one down Route 57, if you go down towards Peaburg. All right. All right, so uh, the Granges began to pop up in the 1860s, and this is something we'll go into much more detail in the Populism video quiz. It sought to bring farmers together uh, to share techniques 
and it becomes the Farmers' Alliances and eventually the Populist Party. They hoped to elect state legislators favorable to their programs. It was, like I said, it was mostly farmers. Okay, I think like unions, but for farmers, not for factory workers. Granger laws, they tried to establish state laws that would regulate the railroads. They argued that the railroad should be more regulated. All right, and uh, you begin to see Southern Farmers Alliances, mostly local, local organizations similar to the Granges. Uh, they would establish, establish uh, stores and banks that were specifically for farmers, uh, for the benefit of farmers and so forth. And they weren't that inclusive, so you also, uh, they excluded blacks, and you would see colored farmers alliances. And that was one of the weaknesses of the Grange and eventually the populist movement, was its racism. All right, so remember, this was a way, this was a resistance to the rise of big business, populism. All right, uh, when someone's called a populist, that usually means you're kind of accusing them of being pro-common man, uh, sometimes to the detriment of the elite. All right, uh, and again, you saw these colored farmers alliances mostly in the southern United States. All right, last slide. You also begin to see eventually the Populist Party, which is somewhat born out of the Granges. All right, the People's Party or Populist Party, mostly farmers. What caused this for, uh, party to rise? The growth of corporate power. Uh, they felt with such an unequal distribu distribution of wealth, it was impossible to be a true democracy. Remember that. So they look for kind of a, a redistribution of wealth, not in the, in the same type of way that you, you know a Karl Marx or a communist would do it, but they felt that the laws now favored the wealthy; they should equal the playing field. These laws that they were advocating, so they they were scared by the growth of corporate power that they were both growing in in wealth, but also wealth equals influence in the democracy. So their democracy, their rights in the workplace, but also their rights within government. We're, we're being we're reducing high rates often hurt farmers remember the farmers had to ship their produce on the railroads this led to economic instability panics of 1873 uh, which helped lead to the end of reconstruction and of 1893 which both severely hurt farmers the goals of the populist movement political reform all right they want a direct election of senators they release a platform in the 1890s that was kind of laughed at by the elite, but a lot of it eventually came to fruition. Direct election of senators. Remember, by, at this time in the 1890s, they were still chosen by the state legislators. And, you know, eventually that becomes reality in the, during the progressive movement. Government ownership of railroads. Now, that never happened, or I shouldn't say never. It happened during World War I, and government does regulate uh, certain aspects of the railroads, but that seemed like such an outlandish idea back in the 1890s. They wanted government uh, reform control over the telephones and the telegraphs. They just basically wanted a stronger government role in the American economic system. They also advocated a graduated income tax, meaning the more you make, the more income you pull in, the higher percentage you pay. They wanted an inflation of the currency, the silver standard. They wanted silver to back up currency, uh, free silver, not just gold. All right, and again, the urban legend is that the Wizard of Oz was about that. The Yellow Brick Road were the people who favored, uh, represented the people who favored the gold standard, and Dorothy's gold slippers, which were, I'm sorry, silver slippers, which were silver in the book, uh, the silver standard. Uh, I'm not sure if it's actually true, but that's the urban legend. All right, uh, we also have during this era business interests versus those of conservationists. You know, corporations, big businesses want to just take all the resources from the land. Conservationists wanted it slowed down. All right, so we have the establishment of national parks and other conservationist and preservationist measures, which we begin to see in this era, more during the progressive era and Teddy Roosevelt, as we get to it. And we see the National Rec uh, Reclamation Act, or the Newlands Act, federal money for the construction of dams, canals, and reservoirs. Reservoirs. All right, uh, there you see Teddy standing on a, a peak protecting that peak. All right, so some test tips for the uh, multiple choice and short answer questions. Uh, the changes in business structure and their effects, you know, the rise of big business and what that meant and what effect it had, the, the increase in wealthy versus poor and creation of, of a poor working class and the, the urban areas becoming uh, more impoverished. All right, uh, the whole Gilded Age thing. 
the role of government during the Gilded Age. Uh, they tended to be pro-business, but as we get more and more towards the progressive movement, uh, the progressives begin to argue uh, by the turn of the century that the government should be more active to protect the common person against big businesses. That there needs to be kind of like a, a reevaluation of that whole classical liberal notion of government hands-off. Maybe we should be more hands-on. And there you have the modern-day liberal. All right, thinking they're a correction of the classical liberal. Uh, maybe a question about the plight of farmers and the, the Granges and the Farmers' Alliances and the populist movement, which becomes the Populist Party, the People's Party, yada, yada. All right, and the goals of labor unions to redemocratize the workplace, to speak collectively against the owner to improve workplace conditions. You know about the American Federation of Labor and the Knights of Labor. Again, things that will go into more detail in other video quizzes. Some essay questions comparing government during the Gilded Age versus other time periods. All right, let's get some of the government interventions in this PowerPoint, in this presentation. Uh, know the ways farmers and laborers resisted, resisted corporations. And again, these are things that we will go into in more detail in other video quizzes. Don't forget, this is a, a broad overview of it. All right, so be sure to take the video quiz that will pop up right now.